privacy. And so, um, my name is Minna Proctor. I edit the Literary Review, uh, which is a quarterly uh, magazine of translations as well as fiction and poetry um, that's been running at a fairly decent university since 1957. I also edit, um, I also write, and I also translate from Italian. And the panel today, it's not a panel, it's a conversation or a round table um, of editors. And we, and I'm going to introduce our panelists, but just so you all know, you're in the right room. And that um, I don't, I, I'm hoping that you as a listening audience group will help us guide the conversation so, because we're here to serve your needs in terms of what you want to know. Um, so I would like to have your input on, on what you want to hear from us. Because um, it could be basic or maybe you have really exotic questions. And, so I don't want to anticipate your needs. Um, so I'm going to start out with um, introducing Kate um, Bernheimer because she has a really long introduction that I like and so I'd like to read it. I asked for notes from people and you can Chris Fishbach who's next sent me exactly 12 words and, Kate, <laughs> and Chris's 12 words are really substantial and, and so Kate said this said also more anyway Kate is the editor of the fairy, editor of the fairy tale review just sit back the Fairy Tale Review is an annual literary journal edited by MFA students, the undergraduate interns, and Kate Bernheimer, who teaches in the MFA program at the University of Arizona. Fairy Tale Review is published by Wayne State University Press and is also hosted on JSTOR. Fairy Tale Review is the only American journal dedicated to publishing contemporary fairy tale fiction, poetry, and nonfiction in English, as well as new translations of old tales into English. So that's very relevant to us. Fairy Tale Review sometimes publishes books, including Lily Hong's, am I pronouncing her name right? Novel based on the I Ching, Changing, which received the Penn Beyond Margins Award for Authors of Color in 2008. Espido's, maybe I should have you read this one. Espido Ferrer. Espido Ferrer's novel, Irlanda, and Johannes Gro. Anson's bilingual Swedish English poetry book, Pilot or Johan the Carousel Horse. Fairy Tale Review is dedicated to celebrating the diverse, innovative art form of fairy tales, a literary tradition with translation at its very, tran at its very foundation. Fairy Tale Review is proud to have published contemporary fairy tales in translation and new translations of old fairy tales from French, Japanese, Spanish, Korean, German, Latvian, Swedish, and other languages. I mean, is, is, does anyone translate fairy tales? All right, that Thank is you. very exciting. Has, is anyone thinking now that they could translate fairy Please. tales? <laughs> the 21st century, yeah. 20th century, 19th yeah. century, 18th century, yeah. anything. Okay. Um, and Kate founded the journal in 2005 as a writer frustrated with the narrow style foregrounded in mainstream American literary publishing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and which excluded a diverse range of international approaches and as a reader enamored with fairy tale literature across the centuries, a body of work she has only had the gift to encounter because it has been translated into English. And I like, I like that. I know you also did an anthology. We can talk about that more, but I'll move on to Chris. Um, so this is Chris Fishbach, who is the publisher of Coffee House Press, um, and which is a nonprofit Press. It only has 18 titles, I say only, it has, that's a huge amount, 18 titles a year. They publish fiction, poetry, and essays. What's interesting about Chris joining us this year at Alta is that their first translation was actually done in 2014 with Valeria Luizelli's book, Sidewalks. And, um, and now, Coffee House is, is uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Coffee House is, is starting to bring translations onto their list. Their focus is Latin American literature, right? Yep. Kaya, whose last name she gets to pronounce by herself. Strominus. Strominus <laughs> from Open Letters, which um, she's the editorial director of Open Letter, which is out of the University of Rochester. It is also a nonprofit literary translation press dedicated to increasing world literature for English readers 
they do 10 titles a year and the 3% website. And Susan, oh no, no. David. <laughs> David Shook, that's with two O's, at Phoneme Media, which is sponsored by Penn, and I put a question mark next to that because I thought you could elaborate. And then, um, and you were at the end of your first season. I'm gonna let you read what you sent me because I can't read my writing. I don't know, let me, what did I send you? Let's see. Yeah, our first season includes poetry from the Uyghur and prose from Cameroon. Um, by the end of spring 2016, we'll have published 17 books from 16 languages. That's very cool. And our first book of poetry, Anna Rosenwong's translation of Rocio Cerrone's diorama, just won the BTBA. There. Okay, that's David. And then Susan Harris, who was really interesting, and I, um, she founded Words Without, if, with Words Without Borders in 2003, which I'm sure many of you know. What was interesting about when I asked Susan to send me her information, it was all numbers, and um, it was like a data set. And I, but then I realized you were working yesterday. You were on the panel where we were discussing women in translation, and, I, and evidently, data is sort of the new. Thing in translation. It's the new black. It's the new, data is the new black. So, so Susan Harris's self-presentation of Words Without Borders is that it publishes monthly, was launched in 2003, and has published over 2,000 pieces from 107 languages from 129 countries, which is very clear and precise, and I think all of that data. Yeah. We are more creative than that. <laughs> <laughs> this is amazing. It's this amazing project with a lot of data. Anyway, so those are our formal introductions to us. As you can see, translation is represented here, and these are all the people who, if you are looking to publish translations, are handling your work. Um, one of the this is a panel that we do that we do every year, um, and it's really meant to help have a conversation with you about how to work with us and vice versa, and maybe you have questions about how we handle translations and what our ideas are. The real question that we start out with is what you look for in a translation, and I'm gonna start with Chris because you have this this Latin American thing that I find really intriguing, and I, so I really wanna know how that came about, and if you can tell us a little bit about your conversion into our world. Sure. Um, well, I kept hearing from a lot of our authors who themselves are translators, um, specifically... Can you hear Chris, by the way? If you can't hear, you need to stand up. Okay. <clears throat> I was hearing from a lot of our authors who read a lot of books in translation and who are translators themselves, um, specifically Brian Evanson um, and Laird Hunt, that they kept urging Coffee House to publish more writers because they felt like there's a lot of the people on our list were in dialogue with their own work with, with writers in translation from all, all over the world. Um, and so but we didn't have any kind of setup. We had no infrastructure to do that. And so after a while looking for funding um, and being told no, I just said, well, we're just going to start and try to build it on our own. And then maybe someone will fund us later. Um, and so we, I, but I had to start. I also don't read um, well enough in any other language to consider myself. And so I had to start by going to Frankfurt, where I'd been going for years. Um, by <laughs> by looking at books that were, had already been translated by UK presses. Um, and so that's how I came across Valeria Luiselli, who had been published by Granta. Um, so we published Sidewalks and Faces in the Crowd, her first two books in 2014, and they did really well. And I realized so then that I, was ha I had a lot of contacts with uh, Spanish language publishers because a lot of our books had been selling into the Spanish language. And so I just started a lot of conversations, and a lot of the editors and shared tastes with me. And so I just decided to basically let's just do that um, because it's, it's it made sense. It was very efficient. So that's one reason. But the other reason is that we traditionally, in our mission, talked about many authentic voices of the American experience. And I realized, like, well, America is not the United States by itself. And so I wanted to start this kind of north-south dialogue. Um, and so that's, we then acquired more books written in English by Latin American writers, and then more Latin American writers being translated. And so I'm interested in the conversation back and forth, and then also kind of across how Latin America and the Americas 
have conversations with both uh, over the Pacific and the Atlantic. So it's a very, the books that we choose from Latin America so far are books that are in conversation with the larger world literature. Uh, I mean, Valeria writes from a Latin American perspective, but she also writes from a very Euro European one. Um, and so then we did her next book, Story of My Teeth, which just came out and that was named PW Book of the Year this, just this morning, one of them. Oh, really? Uh, um, yeah. Nice and, uh, and then Daniel Saldana Paris is our next book this spring 16, and then Diego Zuniga, uh, Chilean writer, is our next title. And I've made bids on a lot of others, but haven't gotten any. So the books that we choose are, it's a gut thing for me and goes along with the aesthetics of some of our other writers. Are your are your writers the people who are reading the books, or are you? How are you? Or are you? Do you hire readers' reports, or how do you make your final determination? Um, I, well, Valeria's translator is the translator for Daniel Saldana Paris too, Christina McSweeney, okay. and so that helped because I was able to trust her and Valeria, and then some other of the Latin American writers. So it became this kind of like triangulation of taste. <clears throat> and I just listen. So it's not our, the Valeria will read stuff for me, but so will there's an editor, um, Diana, uh, Diana Hernandez Aldana um, from formerly of Blackie Books. She'll read things for me. And then I just have a new editor right now who's fluent in Spanish and who's a translator herself. So she's able to read as well. And I, I read like a tiny bit, but not enough to consider. Okay. So I, there are certain authors that I talk to on the list or if there's expertise, like I'll just ask them. So that's it's kind of informal advisory council. Is that the way that a lot of, is that the way you would describe the coffee house generally, the way things get published? Is that, that sort of network and talking to authors? Or? Yes, sure. Okay. Um, and then uh, David, just started. Can you tell us a little bit about the genesis of phoneme? Yeah, I think phoneme, you know, this is the, we're approaching the end of our first full season with distribution. We'd done a couple books before that, kind of, to see if we could do it. Can you hear him? And when I say we, I mostly mean me, about 80%. Um, though I do have a lot of freelancers and, and people who help out. Most of our early <clears throat> books were things I solicited, like uh, Jeffrey Yang's translation of Ahmad John Osman from the Uyghur in Arabic. And most of them came through relationships I had with translators. As a translator and poet myself, you know, I. I feel fortunate to have had those connections. Even Diorama, which just won the BTBA, came through my relationship with Anna, its translator. And then basically I started uh, not poaching exactly, but you know, trying to be uh, pretty quick on the draw with the winners of the Panheim um, grants and uh, the NEA grants and just following up. I think we were really fortunate to have good relationships with our fiction writers like Mario Bellatine, who's been very supportive since the beginning. And almost from, well, yeah, from the get-go, we've been able to acquire poetry of, of outstanding quality. And I think a lot of what we're doing also stems from relationships with international writers directly. Uh, in my former life, I worked in community-based development in East Central Africa and Latin America, which allowed me to meet and inter interact with a lot of these writers. Uh, Roland Ruggero, whose debut novel we're publishing in March, which will be the first novel from Burundi to be published in the United States. That project came through my friendship with Roland, uh, which started, you know, five or six years before Phoneme did. So a lot of these books have been really gestating for some time. Susan, you're kind of the real, you're a real veteran 
at this point, even though it's, it's I feel like Words Without Borders was just invented. It was just, it, like, it was just yesterday, and there was like, oh my god, there's this really cool thing. But it's now since 2003. Right. So um, what's your perspective, just sort of listening to the, these new evolutions, and what can you, can you describe what you're doing? And I think what one of, one of our um, our goals from the very beginning was to present work that has not been a, not only not only individual works obviously that have not been available in English because we do only new translations, but also to introduce uh, work from languages and countries that have been underrepresented in English. Um, our first three issues were Iran, Iraq, and North Korea, um, i.e., you know, three of the axes of evil, and. That was in, that was that was very intentional, because when we know when we know countries through a strictly political prism, as we do so much of the world, we miss we we miss the essentials of the culture, and as a literary magazine, we're we're not political, um, although of course uh, obviously anyone working in translation is doing highly politicized work, but we are not we're not taking a stand, we're not being naive, but we're simply produ we're. We're giving these voices and giving the English language readers um, the opportunity to experience more of the world than has previously been available. Um, much of our mission is not only is obviously not um, along with introducing these languages and countries and cultures. We're obviously very, we're also very committed to introducing writers who have not yet been published in English and who are, for that matter, um, often emerging in their own languages and. Part part of part of what we're dedicated to is to finding these authors a home, a home not only in our pages but also in book form, and we promote very actively to uh, publishers and editors in the field and try to find good fits for uh, work that we publish that we do feel has has legs in English. Um, <clears throat> do you guys? Look to words without borders. I do definitely. I uh, I it's have. It's probably an unfair question. With it's totally sitting. an unfair question. <laughs> <laughs> but I. Oh, they're awful. <laughs> I feel like we can just ask a lot of unfair questions and then we'll expose That's ourselves Elta. and then like we'll put ourselves back together and go out into the rest of the conference. Absolutely. I, mean, I, know. I mean, in terms of your mission, like you have, you do reach out to publishers, and that's absolutely that's and fascinating. You know, um, David, uh, the novel that David mentioned, Roland Ruggiero, we published an excerpt from, in I think it was either July or August. I have no sense of time, but this you know, the serial monogamy of the monthly magazine is really really exhausting. Uh, but um, if you would like a taste of this novel, which based on the excerpt we published is fabulous. Um, you can find that in our pages, and that's the kind of interaction that there, or um, cooperation that I really like to have. Um, we also have uh, we also um, publish we publish excerpts from forthcoming books. We also publish book reviews, which you know again with that. Oh, I'm sorry. How's this? Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm I'm getting over hor horrible. Um, it's a very noisy room, too. Feel free to move up, too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm getting over a uh, plague. But um, w we also do book reviews, which, of course, we all, I mean, is such a crucial part of promoting writers in translation. Um, we're an arena that people come to for work in translation specifically. Um, and we do try to cover books that have not necessarily uh, made it in the mainstream. We did, we did, we did. Features on Bolaño, we would not uh, we would not devote a review slot to Bolaño in favor of someone who was not getting the spotlight. Okay. Did everybody hear that? <laughs> that they started incorporating reviews, and I think this is an interesting question. That that, that the real mission of Words Without Borders is to bring work that isn't already getting attention. So when it comes to Bolaño, for example, who is important to all of us because he's one of those C translated books can be really cool and <laughs> I mean, we like to embrace Bolaño and celebrate him but that in the review section Susan said they would not highlight Bolaño they would review another book and try to introduce something that people weren't already hearing about I know and also I know that I think for all of us and coming from a magazine where we publish primarily out of the slush pile, we don't, the, the unsolicited submissions, 
So if, whether or not it's a translation, often it's a writer that people haven't heard of. It's a very interesting thing to be trying to bring work that's wonderful out to people who haven't have no familiarity with the with the authors and and how do you bring them in and it depends a lot on the kind of oh I know about words without borders so I'm going to go read that because you're not relying on having you know Franz and Slade's diary entry to bring readers to your to your work. Um, Kaya, you were. Hi. <laughs> so, um, can you pronounce your last name again? Strominus. Strominus. Um, can you say, what is, uh, can you describe open letters taste? Um, I feel like the longer I've worked at the press, the harder it is to sort of pinpoint that. Um, I mean, I guess if you if you look at our website, I think we describe the books that we publish or our the mission of what we try to find in literature as books that um, you know either books of cla like classic works in their in their origin countries that may be yet undiscovered or that deserve to be rediscovered, books that we hope that will be the classics of tomorrow. There's also a certain um, I guess it's more of a pattern than a taste, if if that's a more fair terminology in that. Um, a lot of our books are, I mean, we, we do strive to have everything like a very high literary quality and um, a lot of our books seem to have this running pattern of, you know, they're, they're texts that question, um, make you question the way that you read as a reader and make you question mm -hmm. the way that you have been taught to read. Um, and that's one thing I'll use an example. Um, our publisher, Chad Post, frequently finds in his classes with his graduate and undergraduate students that they'll say, well, I don't like the book because I couldn't, um, was I couldn't identify with the narrator. And it's like, well, that's how you were taught to read in high school was answering those sorts of questions in book reports and whatnot. So, you know, making, we want to get people sort of to think about what they're reading and how they're reading it. Um, a lot of the books have unreliable narrators, it seems. We sometimes find patterns, patterns where one of our more recent seasons, there was like every single book had some sort of semi-horrible death in it, and another one had a lot to do with water and boats, and we just don't, it's not something that we consciously do, but we lay out the season, we're like, there's a lot of death in this season, or like, there's a lot of fires in this season. Um, but the, the simplest way of the taste, I mean, we are, our official masthead is four people, um, and one of them is a poetry editor who does her own thing, and officially, Chad Post and I are the first people who will get and read these submissions, and we also have our editorial committee, um, and we also have, similarly to Phoneme, I believe, people, students and former students and other readers from other languages who externally who help us read and get um, commentary and readers' reports. But basically everything we publish is something that we've read and that we've enjoyed ourselves and that we want to share with the wider audience. Um, and also, going off of that, it's something that we believe fits in with our overall list. Because there are books, there are submissions that we've read and we've liked, but it just, we can't find a place for it. Um, and that's sort of a like, pass it along game with our colleagues and friends in the publishing business where it's like, well, it doesn't quite work with what we want, but it would work somewhere else. So um, they're just books that we, we enjoy standing behind and enjoy promoting and have enjoyed reading and want other people to be able to enjoy as well. I like your point, Kaya, about teach about altering the way people read. I know. I, I think that's really that, yeah. that, that, that that's that's what we all want to do as as publishers and writers and translators, isn't it? I really like that. And I was also going to add yeah. earlier with um, in terms of words without borders, and you may have better information than I do in my brain, but I know that I frequently will reference words without borders if there's an author yeah. who. You know, whose name has been floating around, and that's one of the first sites I will go to to see if Thanks. there's been something excerpted. Um, sometimes I will use it as a secondary reference for submissions that we get. And I, I'm, I mean, I don't know by name, but I, I'm willing to bet that there are at least a handful of authors that we've published that you guys have excerpted or Absolutely. done things with. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but. Do you have numbers on that too, Susan? Um, I don't have numbers on what we've 
excerpt it because we've done so many. That's actually, oh, another data point. And the data, well, how many <laughs> things have gone from Words Without Borders into one of these fine houses? That I, can, that I can tell you. We are aware at this point of around 20, we're aware at this point of around 20, 20 authors who have signed book contracts for works that, were, that originally appeared in our pages. And in some of these cases, cases the cause and effect is perhaps not 100% direct, but in other cases we advocated, um, we helped one author, we set one author up with an agent and that ended up very successfully. So again, we're, and, we, and we have a number of possibilities in the pipeline. And I should add too that some of these books are not, these books are not only going into English, because we're read all over the world by people who don't necessarily read text in their in their source languages, but do read English, um, a number of our one of our books or one of our publications sold Spanish. A, a Romanian writer sold Spanish rights because the Spanish editor could read the English but not the Romanian. Um, correspondingly, I think an Arabic an Arabic text sold into Germany. So it's again it's this notion of. of you know, re not only changing the English language market, but also making things available in other languages as well. Um, with the fairy tale review, how do you, um, do you have a, do people come to you or do you go looking for them? Do you have fairy tales that you want to be translated? Are you going to come sit up here? <laughs> We would love to have you. <laughs> All right. Well, you can just chime in at any point. Um, so, do you do you bring do you yeah? So, do you go looking for stuff? Do you have fairy tales that you want to have translated? How does your magazine get put together? Well, it's evolved over the years. The editorial process. When I founded the journal in 2005, it was very much me going out and trying to find things. I, I started the journal as an emerging author of fabulous fiction, really frustrated with the marginalization of not only fabulous works in translation, but among also American authors. It was sort of a, like a one per decade type situation, room for one author from each country over the decade, you know, or 50 year period. Um, I started the journal just knowing there was a great deal of new fiction and poetry influenced, um, of course, ubiquitously by the Brothers Grimm, whose collection was translated into what, 300 or 160, I should know the number of languages around the world, outsold the Bible for some, you know, 100 years. Um, I started the journal really word of mouth, and it was very much talking to really um, authors who I knew, who helped spread the word. Um, Ilya Kaminsky, who was a great advocate from the beginning of helping bring authors to me. Um, he edits Poetry International and is a fantastic poet. Um, but very quickly, well, it was founded as a literary journal and it was word of mouth with literary authors. I found that folklorists, um, Jack Zipes and Maria Tatar specifically, who are both professors in, in Germanic studies and um, exceptional translators of not only the Brothers Grimm, but other fairy tale writers around the world, that they were starting to recommend work to me and to tell me about somebody somewhere um, who was working on a very little known body of fairy tales that was archived for a couple of hundred years somewhere, never been locked in a tower, you know, as in a fairy tale. I found that, I found that folklorists and fairy tale scholars were really excited to be included in a conversation that I had thought was really, um, that was really going to advocate for literary authors who were then really excluded from mainstream publishing venues and even the National Book Awards then excluded fairy tales, folk tales, and myths from consideration for their prestigious awards. We petitioned to have that reversed, and it now um, it quietly disappeared in the night. That exclusion just a couple years ago, though. Um, but it's it's basically it's word of mouth. Other publishers like Action Books or 
authors at Coffeehouse Press, like Brian Evanson has brought me a number of authors he knows about who are being pub um, translated or that he's translating himself. Word of mouth with scholars, editors, and authors, and just a ton of unsolicited submissions. Um, it was surprising and a little bit overwhelming how much demand there was for a journal dedicated to contemporary fairy tales and new translations of old tales, and we publish work from mainstream to experimental. And that's part of our mission, is to not have like a signature style, but to have diversity. Um, Show the breadth of the fairy tale. The breadth of the fairy tale, and because it's so associated with a particular thing. After the journal was in print for a number of years, um, I felt like the mission sort of succeeded because Penguin asked me to edit a couple of collections of contemporary myths and fairy tales, which for which I solicited a lot of translations, actually. And it was it's just been really nice. It's been a really welcoming world, the world of translators and especially fairy tale scholars. Um, so I just, I feel lucky the work just comes. We get maybe 3,000 submissions a year. Um, by which I mean like short stories, poems, or essays. And I work with a team of screeners, not only my graduate students, but authors, scholars around the world, really, asking for feedback on what we get. Um, the the uh, man I just accosted when he came in the door <laughs> is Jim Hicks in the back. He's the editor of the Massachusetts Review, and I'm, I'm just pointing to him. I think that our magazines, the Massachusetts Review and the Literary Review, apart from the fact that we've been running for two years longer, uh, 1957, and they started in 59, so they're like young. Um, I think our magazines run similarly, but since... What? That's a good thing. Uh, you're a newbie. Um, I'm just pointing him out because one of the things that just has come up repeatedly, and you may have noticed, is that all the editors have said, I knew this. There's a lot of word of mouth and knowing people and networks. And since if you, if you don't know one of us, then the way you would get to know us would be here at Alta. So you can get to know him, too. <laughs> Uh, as well as us, <laughs> that's the way, since that's so evidently the way some of these things happen, right? So um, before we get to that, how do you get to know you question and be your trusty advisors or whatnot, um, can you talk a little bit, I'm interested in these, in the structures like of your editorial board versus the screenings of, can you talk about the unsolicited submissions, I guess, I was wondering, who, where's your editorial, where's the Open Ladder editorial board drawn from? Is it from the University of Rochester? Are they advisors that you have? Um, it's, it's sort of a combination of things. So we have, um, there are professors from the Modern Languages and Cultures Department and the English Department who are part of the editorial board. And there are also, um, our readers, or I guess you, the screeners, I've never heard that term, it's interesting as well. Um, and so we have those people. So like I said, it's in terms of receiving things, Chad and I are kind of like the gatekeepers to that. And then when we find something and we think that it should be considered further, then we sort of pass it on to get those other opinions from the MLC department or the English department, the people who are included in our editorial committee. Um, like I, I mentioned, former students, there are um, actually several of, of the students who have been summer interns at Open Letter have either um, started in the Literary Translation Master's program and then they continue to be our readers and help us out with that and be active. And also there are several people who have graduated the program and who we still turn to um, for kind of feedback on things and that's... And translations too, right? The book I reviewed, the... There was a translator who came right out of the program. Yeah, well that's another one of the benefits of the, so Open Letter is very closely tied to the Literary Translation Studies program at Rochester, and that's one of the benefits is that, um, and I, I was in that boat as, boat as well, but as a student you essentially get a year and a half to pitch your project to the press, um, and it's also interesting because as the as on the press side you get to see it as the student is working through the text and you get to know the text from a different level um, and that is one of the benefits of the program is that the possibility so that your master's thesis is a book-length translation which at that point 
is as close to publishable as you can get it within your graduate student confines. Um, and there have been several books since the program started that we have picked up that students have translated and a couple of students whose works we have continued, for example, um, Will van der Heiden, who translated Carlos Labe's Navidad Matanza and then Loquela. Um, you know, Navidad Matanza was his thesis project and we took that on and we liked it and when he said that Loquela was just as good, we read that and became interested in it. Um, JT Mahaney um, translated a Antoine Bolladine book for us um, and he's translating another one for us as well. Um, and that's, 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 a, that's sort of a perk is that you get a little bit of an extra time. It also, of course, looks good for the university because your grad students are being published immediately. Um, but it's also by no means just like a, you don't just get published. But the other perk is that if, um, and, not, and also something I've, I've noticed is that not every student is angling to have Open Letter publish their book, but they do know to use Open Letter and the resources that we have to find a press or several presses that they could pitch to. Um, and there is that, and I forgot what the original question was. I but, have a new one, so. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask a specific question? Yes, please. Poetry is done differently, like you're having an open call poetry now for submission for poetry. So the poetry editor does things completely differently. Um, did, well, did everyone hear the question? It's about how the poetry submissions work. Okay. Um, well, as as I'm not the poetry editor, I don't know exactly how she chooses her things. I mean, we have the submissions are online on our website, which something that we mentioned yesterday. When you when you are submitting or when a person is submitting something, I always would strongly it's just just do it just look at the submission guidelines and figure out because I get sometimes email questions that are answered in the submission guidelines um, and they're really not that long and everyone has different ones but it's it's just nice because it shows that you've done a leaf you've looked into it um, the poetry submissions I mean generally she wants um, she only considers manuscripts that are completely translated I know that much um, she does accept queries for can I maybe send you my poetry? Um, and she does only accept um, hard copy manuscripts through the mail. Um, so in terms of her reading period, I know for a while, like two years ago, she had chosen the one poetry book that she was gonna, that she was gonna have and had almost locked down the second one and then she took a year off because she was on sabbatical. And so um, for us, we, we basically take a, her cue or email. She sends us an email and she'll say, like two years ago, she said, because of my sabbatical and other things, um, can we just put a date online that I will not start reconsidering submissions until I think it was September 2015 or late summer 2015, which, of course, once we hit about late August, early September, there was whomp, a huge stack of poetry submissions in the <coughs> mail for her. Um, but, you know, her reading period is different from ours. I don't know how she chooses what she chooses. Um, does she go to the board too? Does she? I don't know actually. I I would. Uh, my sense is no. I mean, uh, we'll come back to you with the answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't. I don't. I don't know what her process is. I can just tell you what we have on the submission guidelines for her. Um. So can each of you answer how? <laughs> it's a dark board. In, I'm, do you hide, do you choose translators for projects or do you find projects through translators and to what degree? Um, can each of you answer that question? Uh, maybe starting with Kate and going down that way. Um, to date, I have been approached by translators working on a particular author's work or by an editor who knows of a book um, being published in translation that the author um, also has a number of other projects that are as yet untranslated, in which case, generally, the author will know a translator. Um, so I've pretty much mainly been approached by translators or by editors of books in translation who are aware of other works that I might be interested in. Yeah. And Chris? Uh, well, Valeria or came. agents. Yeah. Valeria came with a translator already, and so but and so did Daniel. But that uh, and then the, the Diego Zuniga had already been translated by Megan McDowell, um, and so I have not yet had to go find a translator. But there are some of the books that I bid on that did, I didn't get. I would have had to do that, um, and I would have been kind of. That's probably why I'm here. 
awesome <laughs> to meet people and so I can, you know. Get a sense of yeah. the Spanish speaking translations. So right. Yeah. But I would do the same. I would just do word. I would go to people I know and trust, and like who are some good who translators. Should I, yes. yeah. Who should I talk to? Um, I think we have the similar situation where um, there are the projects that come in with the translator attached. Um, sometimes I know with the um, the ITHL in Israel, they they take care of the translation and then they just sort of give it to you and it's done. Um, so you don't really get to choose in that sense. But it's we haven't had any problems. They've been wonderful. Um, there are other projects where we've found the book and then either found the translator. Um, I can use Voladin as an example because um, I think the student JT had been interested in translating it and because we knew Jordan Stump had worked on his work previously, there was a discussion with Jordan of, oh, is this something that you're working on? And Jordan's like, no, it's cool, he can do it. Um, and then I know that they had their translator discussion about it. So it's a lot of also word of mouth from other translators. Um, if, there's a trans if there's a language pair, uh, that we know a translator, but we also know that translator is swamped with other projects, we will very likely go to them and say, do you have any recommendations? Is there anyone who you would you know, recommend or trust who could work on a project like this? So it is, it is mostly word of mouth, but I feel like for the most part, the, the projects do but when the in books some way. Uh, so you really get a mix, books that come in from translators and books that come in in other languages that are just looking that if you like them will need translators? Yeah. Is it like 50-50? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd say for phoning we're about 60-40 with uh, the 60% being books that are brought to my attention by translators. Right now I'm looking for a Lingala translator for a novel so if any of you are working with Lingala Please do let me know. Did you all hear that? Susan. Um, in our case, it's we, we also uh, have both. When we when we are doing an uh, when we're doing an issue, for example, um, we frequent we do um, more or less an annual Spanish language issue from one of the countries and. When we get a batch of work from our from the consulting editor for that issue, we often have to place that. Now, in our case, we have an extensive pool of Spanish translators, so that's never a problem. Um, in other cases, um, when we're working with when we're working with a consulting editor, uh, she will not only have the connections with the literature, but also the connections with the translators. As was the case in our November issue, which will be Cambodia. Um, we'd never published Cambodian work, anything from Khmer, and we had no contacts in the field, but she did. So those are two, exa two examples on, on either side. Um, for the literary magazine, for TLR, and, I th and correct me if it's different for uh, Mas Massachusetts Review, but all of the work we publish in translation is coming through translators um, who submit to us through the submissions process. Um, we never, we, as far as I know, we have never had a piece in another language that we then commissioned a translation for, which is financial. Um, it, and occasionally we'll have a serial that'll come to us already, like from, from Open Letter or Archipelago that will come already translated, but otherwise it's the translators who generate our international work. Is that the same with the Massachusetts yeah, Review? It's, it's, it's almost always that way. A couple of times I've Answer that way for TLR. Um, 
unless it was a work that if you're if it's a retranslation, it has to bring something really interesting. But um, what I, contemporary writers that has to do with the mission of your publishing house, and it's not necessarily the case for all of you, right? No, we like dead people. You do dead people. Yeah. You do, cool. dead, you do dead people. We publish a lot of dead people. Yeah. Princeton has a series called Oddly Modern Fairy Tales, and they're sort of they're like bringing that. for it's great. Um, they're bringing out a lot of writers who have been overlooked over the centuries. Um, widening the yeah, we yeah. <laughs> so. and more zombies. More yeah. Zombies. What about you guys? I certainly am open to reading uh, dead guys. <laughs> or what dead about ladies. Dead <laughs> I, uh, yeah, you know, dead, dead ladies. Girls, yeah. Yeah. Um, so far, I think I've only published one fairly recently, dead guy. Um, but it, it mostly has to do with conversing with the rest of our list and kind of making sense within the, the broader scope of what we're doing. And I think because most of our books are so contemporary, it, it has to be the right fit. Susan? Yeah. We, we publish contemporary lit. That's our mission. Yeah. And that's, you know, there, there are lots of places that don't. Do, that so. do dead people and... Oh, well, you know, contemporary does have rather a... A, a broad... Uh, it's a flexible category, <laughs> but so, uh, um, we don't even really have a year cut off. But, um, so, no, certainly we have... I, you know, the dead are the better. But um, I, I think we, 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 we um, That's a translator joke. Yeah, that, that's, <laughs> it's, for secu it's for securing rights. Um, right. Nothing like public domain to free up that budget. But, yeah. um, but, but uh, we certainly have had, have had contemporary writers who are not still actively writing, mm -hmm. to put it politely. Yeah. So, so, I mean, there's a mission. There's a mission statement. Is that your yeah. question, though? You're just curious why we all care so much about contemporary literature. Yeah, I was just sort of wondering. Well, I mean, like, I mean, I guess, I guess it goes to really what is the definition of contemporary? I mean, Louis Agron he died in 1982, something like that. I mean, he's a you know very revolutionary writer in terms of the way stuff is getting written now. So I mean, by in a, in a, in a big way, I would say he's completely a contemporary writer. Well, if he died in night, when, when did he stop writing? I, I, I apologize, I'm not familiar with his work. Um, I think he wrote right. Well, you know, again, if that were something that that fit in something else we were doing, certainly it would be. It would. It would. I would not reject it. I mean, when we say contemporary, we don't do nineteenth century. We don't even do really um, first half of the twentieth century, um, and then it gets a little foggy. But in terms of contemporary, that to me is still. I mean, that's not a living writer, but I would still characterize him as a. You know, at least. Um, on the cusp of contemporary. But again, flexible definitions, obviously. I think there's a way to answer that more broadly, which is that um, each of the men, I mean, and there's so many wonderful independent publishers and more and more that are doing translations in particular. And from a literary magazine point of view, there are like 700 million of us online and in print, and we're all really good. Uh, that, that, every, that each press has its own I identity. Yeah. And I think that. And I think that when you're looking to find a place to publish whatever your work, you should be working on what's in your heart to I'm work not on. And then I'm not having trouble publishing this stuff. I'm just, okay. I'm just worried, I just wonder. Like, is, For, is there sort of, as a general, as a general question, is contemporary stuff more interesting to readers I, than the point of view of editors or, or not? I think I it has think to do with who your readers are. For example, when I'm editing Fairy Tale Review, I'm my mission is to reach as many readers, both general and scholarly, as possible. So I'm trying to sort of proliferate the scholarship around a diverse pool of international authors working in the fairy tale tradition, whether hundreds of years ago or today. When I was editing a books for Penguin, the mandate was that they be contemporary works, and I'm there. The marketing of that book, it's a machine I know nothing about, and I think the mandate of the publisher is very different, and so the model by which they're looking at what they're doing is different. If it's not a reprint series, if it's not a translation, so it had to do, it has to do with the mission of the place. I think that's what was my Yeah. So whatever the assumptions of that machine is working on, that's really my question. Yeah. Chris, do you have I think I come, I come to translation from a Frankfurt point of view, <clears throat> and so because having gone to Frankfurt for almost 10 years, like that's... Does everyone know what Frankfurt means? <clears throat> 
so the Frankfurt International Book Fair, where it's everyone and every editors meeting and selling rights to each other, <clears throat> and that's a contemporary like those are all contemporary conversations, and I think that's and those are the international literary publishers, and those editors are talking to each other like that's an engine of translation that makes a lot of decisions for the rest of like translating literature around the world, and that English is very much at the center of that because it most of the people there they all read English because that's the one you consider once something is translated into English then it can be considered by everyone else and then published so it's almost like administrative <laughs> answer yeah. so I was just going to say one more thing I think it's, it's a kind of historical provincialism you know that all, all this emphasis is on contemporary stuff and, uh, and that's all I disagree with that I disagree because <laughs> um, that's not true. It's not fair to disagree. I think that there's, if you're interested in literature, uh, helps solve the world's problems by keeping language fresh. And I think that our interest, that's part of our mission, is to publish works that's publish work that is stretching the language so that we can solve the new problems with new language. And so that's more along the line of like it's almost. Anyway, that that's what I think. I think that that's very interesting. What, what, the, I'm talking about the Frankfurt process. I have a kind of an upstream view. And a, a number of the things I've done have been for Swedish publishers or agents who are taking them subsequently to Frankfurt. Yes. Now, I've, I've translated some stuff I thought was great, but then it goes into the publisher, it goes off to Frankfurt, and I never hear anything more. <laughs> now, I, I don't have any particular personal responsibility for seeing that my uh, sample of 60 pages gets placed somewhere. That's their job. Yeah. But what is what could I do to to promote the process? Is, is it procedural or even ethical for me to say, um, hey, X Press, uh, they've got this. This is really nice. You might be interested in. Absolutely. I mean, word of mouth is 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 huge in our business. Frankfurt is so much bigger than me. I don't. I mean, I'm so little potatoes, so the Frankfurt is really these guys. But it's the pub, the largest pub publishing book fair in the world. It happens every October, and it's it's the entire industry. But then it's the literary point of view. It's all editors meeting with each other and selling rights. That's exhausting. Over drinks, apparently, based on the Facebook pictures. That, uh, but I think what Susan help. was saying was that when you, when when in fact you've been. Commissioned to do a sample by one, a larger house, but not a little magazine, but a larger house, and they bring your work to Frankfurt. Um, and the question is, can I shoot some emails off to publishers who are going to Frankfurt and say, take an extra look at this? I thought it was really good. And Susan's answer is absolutely. As, a, as an as it's interesting you say absolutely because I'm published by Coffee House Press as a fiction writer, and so Chris or that brings my book to Frankfurt. But if I independently contacted an editor and said, hey, I know Chris is at well, Frankfurt and saw yeah. my book, I, that would be, you would be quite, you wouldn't like that. Yeah, answer that question. So it's interesting, an author <laughs> yeah, versus Chris. What have you been up to? <laughs> <laughs> no, I've never done it. So. Well, I think, what, what, what I'm, yeah. I think we might be talking about different. two different yes, things here. Exactly. Because you are, as a translator, you have an inside track to something that a publisher might not. Now, right. I'm not saying that you mount a promotional campaign and send out your sample, but right. for example, um, I'm, I'm often in touch with people who, do, you know, a lot of the translators I work with do these samples for publishers, and I'm always checking to say, what, you know, w w what are you doing for Frankfurt? Is there anything I might be interested in? And that's not the same as, say, Kate promoting her book independently no, of the publisher. Would. Oh, of yeah. course not. Um, it, promoting a book independently of the publisher. And obviously, what you're doing is just alerting someone who might be interested. And you're not cold calling. You know, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're talking. To, I mean, I'm assuming you're talking to people who you know, there's a reason that you might be interested. Um, but again, you do have no. You know, you have no. I hate this expression, but you have no no particular skin in the game. But if it's something you feel would benefit, kind of well, this sounds so self righteous, but would like would benefit the community. Well, Lola, you do so many trans, you do so many samples. Well, I, I would assume that, that an authorization or the original language publisher would be interested in 
you. We would welcome as many exactly. possible uh, any help. You know, yeah. Spread the word as much as possible. In fact, I have agents asking me to sort of do their job for them. Oh, yeah. Well, okay. So right. I think, yeah, if you know some, uh, know of some publisher or, or I think they would almost always welcome that. Because that's, that's just the that's just the submission process. Yeah, that's absolutely. the that that's just the definition of a submission process. Is that I mean I I've done some samples for the Latvian Literature Center that I know they've taken to Frankfurt. But as a translator myself, I don't. That's just part of a submission process. So the literature literature center has it. And I don't have a contract. There's no contract. I've just done sort of a pro bono. Like you want to take something to Frankfurt. Um, I, 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 yeah, I don't, I don't see why you shouldn't be able to because you'd just be submitting something, um, and I, you could either submit it to a publisher and say whether or not I would be the translator for it. This is something I think that you would like to consider as a publisher, and then the publisher could make that decision after that point. But yeah, I don't see, I don't see why you, why you shouldn't. And, I think and, of it less as a submission process than a conversation. Absolutely, right? Yeah. And, and I, I'd also, I'd also say that. Um, I should think that if if you were if you did a sample that you really liked and thought had, was promising, I should think that when you sent it back to the publisher, you could say, "Would would you would you approve of my sending this to journals?" Yes, right. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. a good idea. That is a good idea, actually. Right. Yeah. Um, in the white shirt. When you receive an unsolicited manuscript, do you expect at that time to have permission? Uh, from the authors. So often we, we know the authors were translating and we work with them, but sometimes it gets confusing really who has the rights to the, the, you know, an author will think that they have the right, but it's buried somewhere, not only with that publishing firm, but that publishing firm is owned by somebody for us woman. So it gets really, in, in international intellectual property law is beyond. Most of us. Right. And so you do expect us to provide you with the time of the manuscript permissions to seek rights. It gets very confusing who owns rights at many times for international authors. Before we, I answer this, I want to say that it's going to be different for magazines and book publishers, mm -hmm. and I think it's different yet again for Susan. Right. But for the literary magazines, if you're, if you're submitting a short story or a poem, um, even though it's semi- unethical, we ask the translator to make sure that they have the rights and to not submit unless they have the rights, and that's a question of resources. So for literary magazines, we would like you to come with the rights or a note from the author or a sense that you can do it. I think it's totally different for publishers, correct? Yeah, so. I mean, I don't, we don't explicitly expect you to have that, but it certainly helps. Um, because I think it also, to a certain point, shows that you have done your research. I have had people submit things where I've gone to find out more about the author only to discover that the book they submitted was published six months previously, which is kind of uncomfortable um, because you've submitted something that someone already published and you didn't do the work. So it, it, it's not expected, but it helps. Um, I mean, we've, or even if you have a lead, you know, if, if you say I've kind of I've kind of looked around, the author thinks they have it, but they're not sure. And I mean, as a publishing house, I guess it's fair to expect that we would have certain connections to be able to figure that out. So I, we don't expect it, but it's, def it's certainly helpful. Um, in the same way, and this is off topic, but in the same way it's helpful um, if you know that there's a cultural institution or something that can offer funding possibly. Just, just like little things where we don't, it doesn't make or break it, but it's just little facts and information that's helpful to know when you do um, submit something. We clear rights for everything we publish, and we we. Susan clears rights. She you yeah. do the clearing. Yeah, yeah. we secu we secure rights for everything that we publish. Uh, we pay both our our uh, authors and our authors or publishers and our translators. Um, we we are not really looking at unsolicited work, but when pe when people bring us work, um, we do we we do want to know. Uh, um, we want to know who, who controls the rights, or at least at the minimum, the original publication information, because then we can track it from there. But yeah. you know, again, otherwise you end up with a situation like Kaya described, where someone finds something, probably fell in love with it, and went right into it without uh, without checking. Does that answer your question? Yes, behind. Yes, um, a lot of this conversation has revolved around networking and friendships and reliance on 
people we already know. I know, isn't it frustrating? <laughs> that's great, but for especially for beginning translators, yeah. you may not know those translators. Right. What sort of benchmarks or gateposts or signposts would you be most interested in seeing from somebody you did not know? If you were looking in your slush pile, what would distinguish for you a translator that you might feel more confident in at least spending the time to go through the excerpt or the poem or whatever? Um, my answer is the easiest, so I'm just going to make it <laughs> first. Um, for uh, the literary, for a literary magazine, we, uh, as I, as I, for example, don't even read cover letters. I go right to the submission, so I, I'll be looking at the work before I look at anything else. So the only benchmark for our process for su for submitting and being accepted has to do with whether or not we like the work and it fits into what we're doing right then. And, um, and we don't care if it's the first thing or the 10,000th thing. Um, we're, we're looking really at the work. And I think that's, is that true for the Massachusetts Review, more or less? Yeah. Um, and so I think that that's the, and that would be true for you, you too. So we don't, and, and people, with literary magazines, we're always really pleased when it's a debut project. It's a first publication by someone. It feels like a discovery. Those are our little um, amulets of pride we get to wear. So there's so for beginning, that we're totally open. There's no benchmarks. I think for you guys, when you're looking for new translators, that's a different matter, right? I, I think if, if it's something where I I would be I. I would be hesitant to commission a translation from someone I had not worked with. And, but I would not be hesitant if that person came, and again, this goes back to networking. I'm sorry, this is the way the world, the world works. But um, people who have, been, who have gone through, say, the BCLT's uh, workshop training program, or, sorry? What, what training program? The, the British Center for Literary Translation does a translator's workshop every summer um, in which, and people who go, pe that's a, a rigorous application pro process. Uh, we've, we've found many new translators through that. Um, people who are in graduate programs where people we know teach. Um, and obviously people who have earlier publications. I know this is just like, you know, I know this is chicken and egg. You can't publish if you don't have publications, et cetera. So, yeah. so you could publish in TLR and then write to Susan and say, Minna thinks I'm great. Would you consider thinking I'm great, right? That would Absolutely. be a way to do it. Absolutely. We at Fairy Tale Review are dying for more translations to be submitted, and we're looking to expand beyond sort of the usual Western European um, canonical tales. Again, contemporary, 200 years old, we don't care. So we, please, send to us, <laughs> that's how you get published by us. So, yeah. and then, so apart from the B, BLT? BCLT, uh, BLT. BLT. <laughs> BCLT. <laughs> Is it lunchtime yet? Yeah. <laughs> BCLT. The BLT program. What are the other benchmarks? Do you guys have similar benchmarks? Mm -hmm. You have the University of Rochester program. And, Roman letter. And, but in terms of, you mean like things that you can say, like, come, let me be part of your group? Well, I mean, yeah. what, what, I don't know, like, this is the long term, but sort of status markers, or you know, how, do, how, do I, how do you judge that this is the person I want to talk to as opposed to? I, don't I, want to talk to. I mean, we, we, I don't think that we really do that. I mean, there, I, I generally do read the cover letters, but I will be honest in terms of I don't, I don't look at the translator author CV and go oh this person has two pages and this person has one line because I don't I think that it's fully possible that you can be you know a first year translator let's just say and be just as good as someone who's been doing it for for decades I mean I think it's fair also to say that as a first year translator you probably will need more direction and some more reshaping than someone but I I I don't think I don't think that we have like an a translation ageism in terms of career. Um, I we don't look at that as it's the same with 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 you guys that we look at the work first and foremost. Also, David David mentioned the Penheim Translation Fund, and 
if you have a project that you're interested in, mm -hmm. that is applying for that, obviously winning it, but um, getting your name out in those contexts is also very valuable. Yeah, I forgot mm -hmm. about that. The, anytime that there are any kind of contests, <coughs> I do think that that's um, an excellent. I think poets have to do that too, but translators, I think the more translation prizes there are, the more that you're applying for those, the more when we're looking, I mean, we certainly pay attention to who wins the pen. You know, we're looking at the NBA and the translation, the winners, and thinking what we can do with that information, if anything. But does that help? I mean, if you're here? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So start way in the back. Way in the back. Um, my, my thing, it comes not that the play, but my, you know, my grouse, is that I, I, I speak to someone who's published fairly regularly in online magazines, good online magazines published books, but that would like to apply on the reach certain venues you'd like to meet people who refer you, you know somebody there, and you send something in, and it's unacknowledged. I don't mind getting rejected, you know, that's, that's normal, but there, there seems to be an awful lot of times where it's just like, uh, those that term ghosting, where you just cut off your friends and you're, they're walking about like ghosts. So how often do people, do you guys, think, especially in the magazines, you acknowledge the visions? So we have, I, I, I hope I'm understanding your question, and I think that, I think I have an answer, which is we have an online submission process That's what right. called submittable, and when you submit, it auto-generates an acknowledgement that we oh, received it. I, I think you're not talking about the auto-generated no, response. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're um, we are very slow, and so frequently you may think we haven't answered you, but it may just be that you have to wait another yeah. five yeah. months. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's some people in here who are still waiting to hear from me from like two years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're talking about are things that have really no commercial benefit to this. You know, people are contributing in the old saying, you're not getting anything back for it except, you know, publication. Yeah. And Yeah, and, 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 that's, and it's a very reasonable choice. And I mean, in fact, not like you care about our internal workings, and I'm pointing to one of my colleagues at DLR here because we've been working on it, but we're actually, um, our goal for 2016 is to have a six-month response time, which has everybody in the office trembling. It's just, they, and I say everybody, none of us are in the office, we're all remote, and we all have other jobs jobs and there's a lot of submissions. So it's all of the magazines are working with very limited resources in terms of reading time. But we're aware that it's, that in terms of need of respect, we'd love, we'd, we would like to show as much respect as possible to our contributors because they're everything. And the fact that it takes us so long to get back is not something we're proud of, but it is, it is the reality of our process in terms of resources now and I don't know if you guys have something else to say and I don't know if that satisfies you. I'm ashamed well, of it, but I compare it, <laughs> yeah, I compare it to the old uh, John Panther jacket, you know, with Australia. If you write that, you know, within four days, John will be back to you, and yeah, we're interested in this or or and, and things like and yeah, there are places, you know, that yeah. And, and they're not yeah, and then some of those places aren't as good as we are, though. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have some response? To I that? do. So uh, at Open Letter, I like I said, there are two of us who are the gatekeepers, and by the two of us, I mean frequently if someone emails, I mean there is an email address on the website for submissions, and that gets rerouted to my email address. And frequently, if someone writes to our publisher, he just forwards it to me because. <laughs> that's what's on my placard, that's my job, is to receive those submissions. I try as best as I can to at least get out that response email, that initial response email, which is a form email that just says, we've received your email, or we received your submission, thank you for you know getting in touch with us. We'll do our best to, you know we're, we'll read it when we can. And just to reiterate, there are three of us in the office full time one of these two people is the arts and operations person, so he's not reading the submissions. Um, 
because there are three of us, I'm just my daily thing. I read submissions, I answer emails, I'm fielding questions from translations, I'm editing manuscripts, I'm packing up books for our subscribers and our reviewers. Like we, my, my 40 hour work week is what I go to work with. And Min and I were talking about this the other night. I take work home with me, so I'm working 24 seven. Translators don't sleep on the weekends, neither do I. So I'm fielding emails all the time. Sometimes, because we are human, I actually would love to have a submittable that does these form emails just to that you've received them and then I could keep track of them. Um, I don't actually know why we don't have that, why but don't I don't know. Really? I wrote it down and there's a star next to it. So maybe this is going to be my, my number one thing when I get back That's on great. Monday. Um, but but at the end of the day, I'm only human. And if I'm one of the first gatekeepers and something that Minna said last year where it's not out of the ordinary for a smaller outfit to take three months to get back to you because we are getting multiple submissions and that's an understatement per day and it's not that we're ignoring and it's not that we're being disrespectful I mean sometimes just that we forget there I had one translator come up and ask me about something that has literally been open on my desktop for the last two months during which time my sole purpose in life has been preparing for our press's first ever annual celebration gala so my only response That's was very important work for yeah my <laughs> exactly, which is also that. So in addition to my regular job, I was getting, you know, finding sponsors and auction donors and sending out invitations and going around town. And so there's, there are so few of us and I would love to be able to, like you say six months and I'm getting giddy on the inside thinking that's a beautiful number. And I would love to be able to do that, but it's, I think we don't, we don't mean to disrespect. And I also translate. So I also have those concerns as a translator of, sending out things and getting those responses and I mean I I can apologize and it's like 50 it's it is earnest but it's only like a half-hearted earnest because there are so many other things that are going on and I, I would 100% earnestly love to be on top of it all the time but getting those emails out and that's also why in our submission guidelines and I'm sure other I'm, I know other presses have the same thing in other journals where we also don't have the time to answer queries. So if, uh, if a month goes by, or I've even had someone, like I've done the form email and say, oh, I've got, you know, I've gotten your submission, blah, blah, blah. And a month later, I'll get an email asking, well, did you, did you get to it yet? I don't have time to answer you why I haven't gotten to it yet. And, I, and I'm sorry, and I know that it's frustrating, but that's why we have those things online, just to say, to save you and to save me from feeling awkward at Ulta when we meet <laughs> opposite the iced tea bar and we're both going, <laughs> and then that, so I'm sorry. I'm just sorry. <laughs> what's happening in publishing right now is that there's a lot of small presses, there's a lot yes. of art houses, but there's a lot of translation presses. David, you just started one. It's, that's a very exciting thing that there are more places. But you're starting out of your living room? I have an office. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know that, but can you describe a little bit, I mean, you just started a press, it's very exciting, but it is like, it is your sort of, the resources, even when we're starting these, are limited. Yeah, right? incredibly limited. In with, yeah. And I think, uh, like I said, that's the that's the trade-off of of in some sense of working with translated literature. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, those of us who are publishing it are doing it because we love it, not because we're uh, cashing in on any uh, mm -hmm. secret uh, <laughs> supply of money <laughs> um, and. You know, I, while I also endeavor to uh, to respond, I know that uh, there's a lot of lag time, even oftentimes for translators whose books I'm publishing. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's just a matter of of the hours in the day and the the uh, very small. You know, like I said, I do about eighty percent of everything. I have one uh, one partner and we outsource um, our design and typesetting and then I have a single intern, a uh, wonderful intern from Pomona College who actually has serious responsibilities yeah. because of our size. But um, 
you know, basically if you submit to phoneme, at some point it has to uh, come through me and I've only got so, so much time. So do you, and in terms of being the person um, submitting to any of you, and is it, are you all open to being nagged after a certain period? Of, is it okay to query? How's it going? Um, is there a period of time thoughts about that or is we, nagging bad? We post guidelines on, um, for fairy tale review, there are guidelines on our submission link that's, you know, we use submittable, so you, <laughs> uh, we auto-generate a reply. <laughs> it's awesome, but then the website says specifically two things. One, if you have not heard back after three months, please feel free to query, which means basically please don't before that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm a full-time professor and I edit the journal with no, you know, no release time, no money, et cetera. It's, it's hard. Um, but the second thing that we do, because it can take a certain period of time to get back to people, is we invite simultaneous submissions, which yes. means if you submit to me, you may submit anywhere else that accepts simultaneous submissions. Mm -hmm. The risk is that we might lose fabulous work because yeah. we didn't respond quickly enough, but the benefit for you is that you don't have to wait to hear from us before exactly. you send elsewhere. And, and some journals don't allow that. Mm -hmm. It's important to know, but. Chris, do you take, do you have the unsolicited process? Do yeah, two months a year. September and March, I think. September and March, and you open up to submissions. And that runs like a well-oiled machine. No. Like it's the work. Like it's what I. It's what takes years off of my life. Also, <laughs> like, I know, I mean, honestly, this is making me like. I was like. Ugh. But like, there's so many people to get back from, and it's, <laughs> it's what I think about all the time. More than money, and I'm in charge of money and personnel. So. Yeah. Are queries okay? Um, I think I have a similar. You know, I say don't query before three months. Uh, but I'll like you a lot more if you don't query ever. <laughs> See, that, and that's part, you know, I like being nagged, so. See, I have you enough nagging in my life You have to, know, you have to intuit it. your editor's personality. <laughs> I think there, I also think there's a difference when you say the word nag. I mean, I don't, I think there's a, there's an art to a, a real query email or a reminder email. Um, I personally don't like the emails that give me a specific time frame like well it's been a month since you wrote to me and I'm going shit where did that month go mm -hmm. because I didn't realize it was November already and the ones that just you know the ones that are I, I prefer passive queries that are just sort of checking you in. know just checking in and I think I think if you three months is a good is a good time frame especially if you understand the inner workings of the press you're submitting to if you understand it's a small like I said a smaller outfit if you kind of do the mental math and think how much can you know three to six people physically and emotionally handle um, if if six months have gone by and you haven't heard then I'm totally okay with you know a passive or just a regular query because it's possible that it's been behind you know my like Excel spreadsheets for a month and I or for those six months and I just didn't realize and uh, like I said we're human we forget sometimes or frequently actually um, but that's that's just what happens so I I think the most important thing in your queries is the ton, is the tone that you use in them because if you do send something that I feel is naggy and kind of finger wagging I'm gonna go that's another month that I'm not gonna look at it because <laughs> you have to engage in a passive aggressive conflict situation with <laughs> I mean, yeah. Um, I'd say I'd love to get more amusing queries, so like a joke or yeah. a, a joke. an amusing <laughs> photograph. Okay. Yeah, it's a it's a comic hand drawn yeah. by the person yeah. going. Yeah. Where's I my? Have, I have I have a question for Sue, and um, I promise we'll answer it because my question is real quick. What if you're a translator and you really want to be in Words Without Borders? How do you get in Words Without Borders? Uh, I I actually have a very concrete answer for that. Um, using an example. Um, a couple of a couple of outs ago, a young translator emailed ahead of the conference and asked if we could if we could meet, and I we made an, we made an appointment, and she said to me, I was looking at your site and I see that you have not published anyone from X country, and that's a particular interest of mine. And so we talked about possibilities, um, and. She's do it. She's put together an issue for us. Mm -hmm. Now that is an example of someone 
to, and again, I realize not everyone has this kind of flexibility, but that's an example of someone thinking, I want to be in this magazine because my work fits what this magazine does. And I want to find a way that, that, we, that we can collaborate. Um, if you, I mean, obviously, I'd like to think everyone would like to be would like to be in our magazine. Um, we have only a limited number of slots, of course, but um, I think that all of us would agree that um, if you want to be in a magazine, you can't just have a kind of a platonic ideal. You have to know what the magazine does. You have to have a sense of of its aesthetic, of what it publishes. Um, you have to, again, read the submissions guidelines. We all get very annoyed if you don't because they're right there on the site. Um, and it's, it's a question, too, of figuring out where you fit. I mean, there are plenty, you know, there are so many of us. Nobody fits everywhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, plan, sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I, to, 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 to keep talking about the submissions problem. <laughs> I, I find that the projects that I've worked on as a translator have, have tended to originate with sort of like casual conversations I've had with publishers, either at Alta or at various events in New York. I live in New York, and so I see a lot of publishers really quite frequently, and that's easy for me. But I've never submitted something to a publisher without knowing in advance that it was something that they were interested in, because we had a short conversation where I'd said, oh, I have this author that I've been doing something on who I find is really interesting. And they've said, oh, I would be interested in hearing more about that. And so I'm wondering if, you know, for people who, for publishers who are not in New York or for translators who are in places other than the publishers, would you guys welcome a short little email saying, uh, you know, with like pre-sentences like, I have this author that I'm interested in, this is the kind of thing they write, is this something you would be interested in, in seeing submitted? So that you could do a quick little yes or no, mm -hmm. and then that would, I feel like that would save people a lot of trouble, but I also feel like from what you've been saying, Kai, and what other people have been saying, you already have so much to do. More than that, that it's, that it, it's a query. It's a, so query. Basically, do people want to see queries? Is yeah. the yeah. question. Yeah. In lieu of a cocktail party conversation. I mean, sometimes. Sometimes there are queries that are very clearly, like you're saying, Sean, that there are specific things that you know that it's like a it's like a trigger word for the press that will get our attention, mm -hmm. and other times. I mean, in, in terms of the fiction queries, we talked about our editor, oh, I think she left, but our poetry editor can invite queries, but generally my stance is, you know, I'll, I'll look through it and I think, you know, 95% of the time I'm just going to answer yes because, um, you know, I, I don't have the time to click through wiki links that are attached to query emails and that's not, that doesn't sound like what you are describing, but we have see, received query emails where it's, you know, this author with this book and then like 40 wiki links that I don't have the time to look through. And so I'd much rather prefer a simple query like that. And I think generally because we, we are interested in reading new things, be it for something that we want to publish or just something that I would like to read published by someone else. And for the most part, I think that my sort of across the board answer would be sure, we'd love to look at it because you never, you never know. I mean, sometimes your query description turns out to be completely not what the book is um, and it could go either way but I don't I don't mind those I think an elegant informed query letter that shows that you know what the mission of the press is etc I love those and I if it's something I can't do I'll always if it some, sounds great I, I'll refer that person to an editor mm -hmm. I know or forward you know with permission the email to somewhere else it's like a, it's a conversation yeah I welcome that but they might be slow to respond <laughs> Two months. Um, well so to me submittable has changed that whole thing because it doesn't before I when I started it was all query letter sample manuscript and had to do with space and time but now it's electronic so it doesn't matter so I don't care like it doesn't because it's you do the query letter and it just happens to have the manuscript there that I can read further mm -hmm. but um, that's no I understand for translation I know it's different but I mean like that that that's just like but that that can still be submitted through submittable like that and that's fine yeah yeah yes Um, do, you, do you want us to introduce the work and our 
Yeah, okay, so um, I sometimes don't read the cover letter. That was just a threat. But I sometimes do. So you should always send a cover you should always you should always send a cover letter because and I think we'll all agree it's a professional interaction. Yeah. And you should present your work in the most professional light, which means you must have a cover letter and it should be kind of like in English, properly, you know, nice and every get the right name on it, that kind of thing. Um, not dear Mr. Mr. Proctor, but um, <laughs> but um, with a translation, and I'm going to defer to Jesse, but I think we do like a little description of who the person is. I don't think you ever need to tell us the plot points of what we're then going to read, but but we do like the context for mm -hmm. the author. Um, but you don't need to describe the work that we're about to read for a lit that you don't need to do that for a literary magazine. You might need to do it for a full length manuscript. Yeah. They're shaking their heads. So for a full length manuscript, you should give a plot synopsis. For a literary magazine, it's different. Would you want like awards that the author has won, uh, readership, other languages? They've been I think whatever's interesting about the author. Okay. If the author is really interesting because they win a lot of prizes, then yeah. If the author is really interesting because they're 12, then yeah. You know, if, if they're a bear, <laughs> yes. if, yeah, a bear. If, if the author is a bear, that's really interesting. So I would include that information. Anything that's like the most interesting thing about the author. Um, we're supposed to wrap up. Does anyone have any more questions? Um, okay, and we're here for you if you have other questions at other points in the conference. That's our job. Absolutely.